Yeah, so as he said, I'm, if you don't know who I am, I'm Andy Nichols, and I'm a software engineer at uh, the Qt company. Uh, uh, you may also know me by my online handle, at Nesticle. I work in the graphics team in Oslo, Norway. And generally, I'm not working on uh, like, like UIs and Qt Quick. I'm usually working on the, the lower end rendering side of things. So again, like I'm maintaining the, the scene graph renderer in the, the 2D renderer for Qt Quick, and, and now uh, Qt Quick 3D. But as part of that, you know, uh, I've been working on a lot of uh, like UIs that you know for for editing things in the 3D engine, and also is I'm really a, a Cute Quick evangelist. I love Cute Quick. Uh, I, I've ever since it was first released, I think it was 4.7 based on Graphics View. I've been there. I'm all for it. I love Cute Quick, and I've tried to incorporate Cute Quick into everything that I've worked on so far in the Cute company, whether it be embedded or now Cute Quick 3D, uh, uh, a Cute Quick first 3D engine. So. Today's talk, uh, again, tips and tricks for writing Qt Quick applications with a specific focus on the desktop with Qt Quick controls. And I guess I'll start with uh, what's probably going to be the hottest of hot takes that I have, and that is you should be using JavaScript in your Qt Quick applications. Which is, you know, a bit controversial because, you know, for years we've said limit your JavaScript down as much as possible. You know, very embedded focus. You know, start out optimizing at the beginning. But JavaScript's really what makes Qt quick quick. It's not about necessarily, you know, the performance aspect, but that rapid iteration and, you know, having access to those front-end developers that, you know, are may not actually be familiar with C++ and are more familiar with JavaScript. And I'm also of the opinion that writing front-end code in C++ is premature optimization. Like, again, another very hot take or very controversial take, especially from, you know, a Qt developer where, you know, for years that was the primary way that you would be writing user interfaces. But again, it's kind of unrealistic in, you know, 2020 that, you know, you're going to have a whole front-end team that's all competent C++ developers, you know. It's going to be made up of people that may not even be familiar with C++. So really take advantage of, you know, that ability that Qt Quick has JavaScript and do use it to your advantage. But QML is not just JavaScript. QML is its own thing that has JavaScript. So Let's talk about how to write better QML code using the, the newer features that have been added, you know, because again, QML has become quite a mature technology. It's been around for over a decade now, and we've added a lot of things to it since then. Uh, the first thing is actually uh, QML has support for type annotations now. And if you're familiar with, you know, the JavaScript methodology, you know, you use things like TypeScript you know, to have that type annotation and then compile it back down to JavaScript. Well, QML has that built in. So for example, here in this QML component that uh, I have here, it's, it's a rectangle container. So the first thing you see is that uh, when I have a, a property that's required for this class, I don't use var, you know, to say, oh, yeah, it's just some array. It's No, it's specifically a list of rectangle components. And now you have that, you know, check there that when someone sets this property that it's expected that it's going to be that. Similarly, when you have JavaScript function calls, you can then annotate both the arguments and the return type, like based on the types that you expect to be there. So for example, in this get random color function, it's expected that it's going to return a color value. Or in the set random color function, it accepts an argument of a rectangle component. So it's going to, you're going to have that type checking there. It's for your organization, you know, and also later when you know, you get to the process of compiling QML code, which we'll talk a bit about in a little bit, like we actually have that information that, that we can know what to do in that case. So here you can see a couple of examples of how I've used type annotation for, you know, writing my JavaScript in QML. The next thing is that you have type assertions uh, for QML types in, you know, JavaScript code. So for example, here in this property binding, I'm using the as keyword from JavaScript, which is aware of QML types. So the rectangle component is not a JavaScript type. It's a QML type. But we know about that type in QML, so we can use that as component. And then I'm also using the optional chaining operator here for this you know, pattern of, well, if it is a rectangle, then you can use the color property. But then if it's not, you know, then it's not truthy. So then we can fall back to a hard-coded value of red. 
that you know, gives you a, a good pattern of not having to have some crazy logic there, like this is pretty straightforward and a very modern pattern to use in QML. Uh, similarly, uh, there's also the instance of keyword in JavaScript. That is also type aware in QML code. So if you are you know, using more JavaScript, as I suggest, like it's going to return something, and you then need to write some code that's actually validating that that's what you expect it to be. So that's, uh, yeah, my recommendation for that. And that all comes back to, you know, you should be using the QML linter. Uh, another common pattern in writing modern JavaScript code is that you almost always have a linter going because there, there's so many pitfalls that you can fall into with these high-level languages. And the same is the case with QML. It's, it's easy to write, you know, bad code in a high-level language. But with a linter, it's going to, you know, help you, you know, continue to write good organized code that takes advantage of that. So things like unqualified access and you know, making sure that you know, the types are specified. And again, it's going to give you hints about how to write good code that can be compiled into C++ or decent bytecode with the QML compiler. So all versions of Qt, both open source and commercial, will have compiled JavaScript code in one way or the other. So either through QML cache gen or QML SC or the QML script compiler. Script compiler has some more advanced functionality, but QML cache gen also will do all of these things. So for example, rather than having a straight text document like a QML is just a text file, it's going to convert that to a binary, like a binary representation. It's going to convert everything, at least, into you know, bytecode. And then for the constructs that we can actually understand, so functions and bindings that are written in JavaScript, those will be actually converted into C++ code and then compiled, linked, and put into your project. So like, that is like proper compiled code in the same way that your you know, regular C++ code is. And all of this works automatically without you doing anything if you're using the Qt add QML module function in CMake, which is the next thing I want to talk about, because you should be abs absolutely be using this, this functionality, the modern way of creating QML modules, which is with Qt add QML module. Because Previously in Qt Quick, you had to do a lot of things manually. Maybe you're having to Qt create QML deers. You're having to you know, write Q QML register type. Uh, well, all of that's done for you if you're using the new pattern with QML element and uh, Qt add QML module in CMake, and a as well as being able to run the 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 script generation that I or the compiler that I mentioned before. So here's an example of how that actually looks in CMake. So this is just a very simple C++ application. In this case, uh, I'm adding exec an executable for the QQuick sandbox. In, in the main, would just have something like a, oh, just load this module into a QML viewer, that kind of thing. But the module itself uh, is pretty straightforward, uh, where the URI property is the thing that you import, so import Quick sandbox. Versions are optional in the actual import, but this is the version of the module. And then you have a couple of sections. So one for the QML files itself. This would be the pure QML. And then for the sources sections, that would be your C++ files that are exposing types to the QML module. So these would be things that have the QML element macro. And then the resources section, which would be just like a convenience for like the QRCs, so the assets that you're going to bundle along with your model, module. So in my case, I show a font and a image that gets bundled with it. And that also you know, brings up the next thing, which is you know, our, a common pattern that I use, is this sub-modules concept of, of, of modules. So like, usually when I build a QML module, it'll be built up of several different things that I then pull in later. So for example, I have a script console, I have a code editor, and then maybe some test data. And so here you can see it's just a matter of adding the subdirectory. There's several different ways to do it. But in this case, it's all part of the same project. So I just you know, use something like git submodules, pull in those pure QML modules that I might pull into several projects. And it just, it, they themselves just have Qt add QML module. They build a, a standalone module. But in my case, because I'm using CMake, as long as I just link against it, then they get pulled into the project and they're useful and, and like everything that needs to be done is done. So it's really quite straightforward to use a Qt add QML module. And then to go back a bit, I mentioned this uh, QML element thing. Uh, and this is something that you absolutely should be using today, because this is the, the new easy way of exposing types from C++ to QML. Uh, the primary way is QML element, and basically when you add that to your you know, Q object based class, 
it's going to ex automatically do all the registration to expose whatever your C++ class name is directly as a QML component in, well, the QML side. In this example here, I'm using the alternative, which is QML named element, because I wanted to change the name of the class from code editor item to just code editor in the QML space. Uh, you also have like the other type. So when you want to create a singleton, for example, you would also append the QML singleton. And then you've, from the C++ side, created a QML singleton. But this is, comes into one of the caveats of that is that if you, were to, if you wanted to create a QML singleton in pure QML code, there's a bit of a thing that you have to know. And it's, it's documented, but maybe it's not obvious. So the first thing is that like, if you wanted to do this, in the actual QML file itself, so in, the, in my example, the script context.qml, you just need to make sure to have this pragma singleton at the top of the file. But normally, if you, with pure QML modules, you need to also, in the QML dir file, tell it, yeah, that particular file is a singleton. So if you're using CMake and it's all automated, this is the thing that you need to add. So the trick is that you need to set source, for, set source file properties to add Qt's QML singleton type true, and then it automatically adds it to the generated QML dir file. So just something to keep in mind. Another trick related to modules is resource files. So one of the problems that I actually have with the built-in resources of like, you know, in the original QML module is there's only one. But sometimes I need to add additional resources to that. So for example, one of the problems I run into is that I have a large 3D asset that I want to import as a QRC, but then every time that I change that resource, like one of the resources, like the QML files, now it, it takes a really long time to relink that because those really big modules take quite a long time and a lot of memory. So if you want to use additional resources, you can. But there's a caveat, and that's with regard to prefixes. And that's where another new feature comes in, which is you know, by using the Qt standard project setup, uh, it's actually setting a policy where all QML modules are exposed or defined under a prefix of Qt or slash Qt slash QML module, or like slash Qt slash QML as a base and then the URI. So then if you want to add additional resources under the same prefix, you then know that if you use this uh, Qt standard project setup for 6.5 and later, that this policy will be set in CMake, and then you can use a hard-coded prefix to that same slash QML slash, slash Qt slash QML slash your module URI, and then that's where it'll be located. So two examples here is just adding a resource, which is the equivalent of, like, say, QRC, but CMake style, or Qt add shaders, which is you know, another feature of CMake when you have shader files and you want to generate the shaders into QSBs directly from GL shader stuff. So that'll automatically do it. But if you want it to be accessible from your QML module, it needs to have the right prefix. Another trick that you might run into if you're using the hot loading or live coding pattern in QML is that there is a QML component cache. So, and this is these, this QML component cache, it happens either if you're using the loader or if you're using cute.create component. And basically, because you need to create, like, how do I create this object and then create the object? Well, if you were to change the original data in that source file, so for example, you had some source code, and then uh, you change something in it, and then you tried to reload that, it would only reload the original version because it's cached under that same URL. So you have to do trickery with the URL. Uh, because we don't have a way to do this non-programmatically yet. So one of the tricks that I learned was that you could change the URL to include a query, because queries don't really mean anything in QML, but it changes the URL. So then now what's cached is something different. So in my case, I just add a revision as the query, and that fixes the issue that now I can just continuously load the same file. Of course, you're filling up the cache, and you'll have to manually trim the cache. But uh, this, this will help if you're using the live coding pattern. OK, so to move on to Qt Quick Control specific pitfalls and solutions, uh, let's start with uh, something that's not specifically Qt Quick Controls, but something that comes up all the time with Qt Quick Controls is this confusion between positioners and layouts. I quite frequently see people using positioners when they absolutely should be using layouts. Positioners, and we're actually calling them that now, you know, is this column, row, grid, and they're called that because all they do is position. It's all about what, where something should be located relative to something else. It has nothing to do with sizes. All sizes are explicit. It has no alignment. It's all completely manual. And generally speaking, if you're making software, like it's, a, it's kind of a special case in practice. Like 
generally you're going to want to use the actual layouts because this is working much more closely to, say, what you were doing in widgets. So that would be the, the, the things under the cutequick.layouts import, so column layout, row layout, grid layout, et cetera, because there you're actually able to you know, not only get the position, but also the size and the alignment. And this is all done through the layout attached property. And so here's a quick example of that, uh, where in a scroll view, I actually have a column layout with a series of individual row layouts. And you can see here that I'm using the layout attached property and in individual child components of layouts to set the alignment, to set the minimum width, like basically give hints to the layout of like, here's how things should stretch when I resize the UI. And also, you may notice here that I'm using implicit width and implicit height uh, instead of hard-coded widths and heights. This is also uh, a very good practice to use in general with Qt Quick, but especially with layouts. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. The next thing is that when you're making desktop uh, applications, like native styles become a lot more important, especially on platforms like macOS, where like certain expectations are going to be there by your users. So, the problem with that, though, is that generally speaking, you're going to want, like, sometimes your control, the controls that are built into QtQuick are not sufficient for, like, everything you need. Like, just like in widgets, you had to sometimes make custom widgets. Uh, you'll have to make your own custom QML items. And you still want them to look native. So the trick there is actually to use the control color palette. So every QtQuick control has a palette property, and each of these palette properties will have roles. And that's what we're using in QtQuick controls for the styles, especially the native styles. And so if you want to blend in with native stuff, you have to use this palette as well. I have an example application that I link here that basically all it does is print out a table of all the different palette roles just to give me an, an idea of what they'll look like with the style. And what's nice about these palettes is that when, for example, in Mac OS or other platforms that support light mode versus dark mode, when you change the light mode to dark mode in the system, it's actually changing the cute palette. So if you're using these palette colors, your UI will also update with those new palette colors. So if you're using the roles correctly, you'll get that for free. But if you weren't using the palette, you would need to also you know, manually query if you were in dark mode or light mode. So if you had, did have your own color palette, this is how you check for if you're in light mode or dark mode with those two lines there. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, another thing, and this comes with a very big warning, because this is a trick, but you should not do this, uh, is that you know, if you try to style a native control, Generally, this is not allowed. And it'll give you a warning saying, like, you're not allowed to do this. But you know, in some cases, like, you know better than us, potentially, like, that I can support this. So this will be fine. Of course, we'll probably break your code in a later version of Qt. But this is the trick to get rid of the warning. So when you over override one of those uh, delegates for the style, if you have that property, this is what we use internally. You can cheat, too, and use this. But you shouldn't do it, because naughty. You know, you've been warned. But making your control, own controls in general, uh, it's one of the important things you should do is that don't inherit from item, inherit from control. Like the cute quick control base class is control. Two reasons. One, you get the palette. You automatically get the palette thing exposed to you uh, for that control in that part of the hierarchy. But also, it's about uh, focus handling, at least in the current version of Qt. Like there is some difference in semantics with focus handling in items versus cute quick controls, because controls has, have a much more advanced scheme of like how focus handling is done. So you get that for free if you're inheriting from control. And I mean, ideally, you should build from sub control. So if an existing control like fits into your custom control, you should try to use that by default when possible, uh, just you know, trying to be native uh, like without having to do so much work like we talked about in the previous slide. And then, Continue to use implicit width and implicit height instead of hard-coded widths and heights. Like, unless you absolutely need something to be a particular size and only that size, like, uh, opt for using implicit width and implicit height instead. But one of the problems you will run into when making your own QML components purely in QML and not in C++ is bidirectional property binding issues. That is the issue where you're in JavaScript and everything is references. So. For example, uh, I make a control here that has just a value property. And ideally, that property would be bound to something in the back end. But then if you had some control, like a slider that was to change that value, you want to update that value in the back end. But the problem is, is if you set that value in your QML control, you've just overwritten the binding. And like now the back end is now out of sync with your value. So in the case of a slider, uh, if you were to drag the slider but change the value, then it wouldn't 
uh, update the backend value. Of course, in, because slider is implemented in C++, we're not changing the binding. We're changing the underlying value, because we can do that in C++ because we know. But if you're in QML, you're in JavaScript land, and you just, you know, everything's a reference. So you didn't change the value. You changed the binding. So uh, that's just something to look out for, because you need to do tricks like this, where this is the pattern that I use uh, over here on this sum control, where you have an internal value that's hidden that you start out by, like, that's your definitive value. Uh, because, like, if you don't have something, like, you don't have a backend, like, you had a slider that did not have a backend attached to it, you still want the value of the slider to be changed. So you need an internal value. But then if you do make an external binding, like, that then becomes the definitive value. And now you need to make suggestions to that, that, like, I think you should change this value, but it has the, the ultimate decision of whether it accepts that change or not. So when you move the slider, uh, I think it should be this value because the user said it should be, but it's not that value until you accept it. So over on the other side, on value modified, a new signal, and then passing that value. So it's not the same API, but this is the proper way to do it in a pure QML sense, just because JavaScript land can be you know, different because of the property bindings. Another thing that will come up when you're making desktop applications is that you will sometimes need to do platform-specific code. So one of the places that I run into this is with menu bars, specifically on macOS. So if you put a menu bar inside your window on macOS, like that's, you're not native already. That thing needs to be up in the menu bar that's a system control. So uh, at least right now in the current version of Qt, if you were to use the built-in controls menu bar, like they're going inside the app and not up in the menu bar. So I actually end up having to use the labs version of this. Uh, to make it work. And the way I do that is by using uh, what's called file selector. So this is the idea that if you have a folder with plus and then the file selector name, it will then look into that folder to see if there's an alternative version that meets that file selector. So if I have this, this file system over here where there's a default menu bar, and then if I've specified you know, this native menu bar or Mac OS plus Mac OS or plus native menu bar, then it's going to use that implementation instead of the default one in the parent directory. And that's the trick for doing things for like, you know, alternative versions of something uh, in QML. And the last thing I want to talk about is tree views, because uh, in desktop applications, tree views are everywhere. Like, I, like it's, it's hard to make a desktop application that doesn't have some kind of tree view. But the problem with tree views is tree views are hard. Tree views are hard in widgets, and tree views are also hard in QML. So I'd like to show you like, how that actually is supposed to work. So here's like, a rough overview of like, what you're supposed to do. Uh, so first off, you have to have a model. And that model needs to be done in C++. And I'll, I'll show you the details in a second. Uh, you, there's no like at least in the current version, there is no QML version of a model that is acceptable by a tree view. The next thing is that you, know, you want to have a header view in a typical tree view. So that has to be, in this case, I have a, a column layout that just has a header view and then a scroll view, because I want the data to be scrollable, but not the header. I want the header to stay fixed. So I have that. I have a scroll view. And then inside the scroll view, I have the tree view itself. And I'll go over each of the details. So first off, the back end. Uh, this is the hard part. It's the exact same thing that you had to do in widgets, which was, again, the hard part, because you basically have to use everything that's in a queue abstract item model. So there are some convenience subclasses already of this for like file system. But like when you're doing your own data, this is roughly what you have to do. And I'll go over the few things you need. But basically, you're going to want to talk to some hierarchical data in the back end. So you may need to create some interface. Like in this case, I have this tree item class here. But the idea is basically you need to translate back and forth between a queue model index and backend data. So that's, this is roughly how it works in my example of like I'm implementing this index function to translate to you know, a raw row column and parent to a queue model index. And then on the back end, I have a way of looking up the, going from queue model index to a pointer to some data in my back end. So that's how the actual translation works. Uh, the next thing is the getting and the setting of the data. Uh, the getting is pretty straightforward in that you take an index and you want to query, like, for this particular uh, role, here's what the value is. So I guess in the display role case, it's just returning you know, whatever the, the text is at that particular item in the back end after doing the lookup. 
For set data, that's if you want to go and set a model index to that value. And um, there's also a few other things like the, the header data, or, or like first off the flags of like, is this item editable, is it selectable? And then the header data is about what text you put in those columns. Then there's the delegate, which is the display of each individual line in the, in the rows. Uh, this is really easy post 6.6, because it, in, in, especially in the code that I use, because it's just tree view delegate, like the, the, the part on the, the left here. That's all you need to do, and you get exactly what I show here in that picture. Before 6.6, you needed to do all that. And if you want to do anything custom, you also need to do all of that, at least, because you have all these required properties that are built in. But the thing about tree views is that you're responsible for drawing the indicator of it's closed, it's open, as well as the indentation. Like You're responsible for all of that. So it's fairly complicated. Fortunately, you can use tree view delegate, and it looks pretty native out of the box. The next thing, the view is pretty straightforward as well. In the desktop space, uh, I have to do a couple of things to make it like behave well on a desktop. Like I don't want it bouncing around when I'm scrolling, so I turn off that behavior. It's just the setting up the models and the delegate. One of the interesting things that I did have to do, though, to, to get parity with tree view, Q tree view and widgets is that the default behavior there is that the last column will normally fill all of the available space that you give it for the tree view, but it doesn't by default in QML. So I actually had to provide a custom column width provider to say, oh yeah, the last column, that should be the width of, of the available width that's, that's there. I also had to do some stuff for the header. Like, so there is a default implementation for the delegate in the header view, but it doesn't, at least in the current version of Qt, look very native, especially on Mac OS, because there's no like column slide, like the little white thing next to column one where you can resize the column. It's there, but you can't see it. So I implemented my own custom delegate for the header. And again, you can see here I'm using palette colors to make it look like follow when I switch from light mode to dark mode. And so these are the kind of things you have to do now. And of course, you know, now that like, I mean, especially I see it, I went down to the, my colleagues in the other department and said, hey, how about this? And now they're adding that to new versions of Qt to fixing these issues. But like today with 6.6, the release version of Qt, these are the kind of things you have to do. But you can get a nice tree view. And you can do these things in Qt Quick. It's just, you know, there's some rough edges still. Uh, and I'd just like to point out a couple of uh, community projects, or like in this case, uh, this is a project done by the maintainer of Qt Quick. And it's actually an excellent source of information of uh, uh, the right way to do things uh, when you're making desktop applications with Qt Quick controls. And the maintainer of Qt Quick controls, like, he would know. So it's, this is a great project, and I recommend you check that out. Also, uh, I'd like to shout out to the unofficial communities of the Reddit, the Qt Framework Reddit, and uh, the Qt Discord. This is an excellent source of information about Qt Quick. And uh, I'm also available there, again, as at Nesticle. So I'm in both of these places. So if you want to reach out, that's a good place to do it. And that's it. Thank you for joining today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.